Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description and click the join button below for more details. My name is Saba, and today we're starting to investigate a wide and very important topic in financial time series analysis, which are tests for the detection of financial contagion. We are very interested in um, studying relationships between different financial markets, be it different asset classes, be it different country-specific markets, subject to crisis times or uncertainty. How does systemic risk and, more broadly, interlinkages between those markets evolve or change subject to crisis pressures. And there has been a wide variety of tests developed over the past two to three decades that are designed to address that. And today we're starting with the simplest one, arguably, and one of the earlier ones, which is the 2002 Forbes and Rigobin test for financial contagion that seeks to determine whether correlations between different markets changes across periods subject to crisis and uncertainty and it also designs some adjustments that are aimed at tackling uh, various assumption violations that could be associated with easier implementations of this test. And uh, to visualize the application of the Forbes and Rigobin 2002 test, we have got a very simple data set. We have got US specific stock and bond indices. This is the uh, S&P 500 tracker fund. This is the uh, exchange traded fund that invests solely in short term government bills. So we have got daily data from year-end 2018 until year-end 2020, and we'll split it into two periods based on the WHO announcement on the 11th of March 2020, when the uh, crisis um, concerns surrounding the pandemic have become uh, very evident and uh, fully materialized on financial markets. So we'll split it into two subsamples before the 11th of March 2020 and after 11th of March 2020, and detect whether there has been financial contagion between stock markets and bond markets um, that are, is associated with the WHO announcement. For that, we'll calculate daily returns using those total return indices over here, dividing the value today by the value yesterday and subtracting one, enforcing it for both series and across the full sample. And now we'll need to evaluate the volatility of individual asset classes across the crisis period and the non-crisis period, the subsample sizes, again for both periods, as well as correlation between stocks and bonds before the crisis period and within the crisis period. So for the volatility, we can use the sample standard deviation function. We'll drag it down until we arrive at the 11th of March. We'll stop just before the 11th of March. We see that it is row 301. That would be quite crucial for us later to remember that, because that's our breakpoint. We can see that the uh, volatility of stocks uh, during the non-crisis period was 1.10% per day, which is again on the lower side for stock markets. If we drag it across for the bonds, we can see that government bond uh, exchange trade fund volatility is very low. Um, again, in the range of one basis point per day, quite typical for so-called risk-free asset, isn't it? And then for the standard deviation in the crisis period, for the volatility in the crisis period, we can copy this formula and change the cell reference so it only starts after the crisis period begins. So on the 11th of March until the end of our sample period, which is row 507. We can see that in the crisis period, the volatility of stocks has increased quite a bit. It almost doubled, which again, might not be surprising, but what is it relevant for? It is for the estimation of crisis specific correlation coefficients. It is well known and can be quite intuitively proven that uh, correlations can uh, be biased due to heteroscedasticity. And as we proceed from a non-crisis environment where volatility is low into the crisis environment when volatility is high, our measurements of the correlation coefficient in these two epochs, in these two subsamples, these two states, uh, would not be on the level playing field. It turns out that the correlation coefficient we'll measure for the crisis period could be biased upward due to the increase in volatility. And that's exactly what Forbes and Rigobin propose to address to make the test results 
more interpretable and more robust. If we look at the bond volatility, on the other hand, we can see that its volatility has not increased much. And uh, this is something that's quite uh, relevant for the proper specification of the test, as if we look at the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, obviously correlations uh, between stocks and bonds and bonds and stocks are the same. And the correlation of uh, one to another will be the same due to uh, symmetry properties. However, for the definition of the contagion test statistic, it's important to understand uh, which direction the contagion is going in. This is crucial for adjusting our uh, correlation coefficient for heteroscedasticity. Here, as we can see that the volatility of stocks have increased, but the volatility of bonds has not, it would be more natural to presume that the stock market is indeed the propagator, the origin of our uh, contagion that we seek to evaluate. Again, this uh, needs to be justified theoretically. Uh, however, it is always important to uh, make sure that you correctly specify which direction the contagion goes from. Sometimes it is evident from your estimation design. For example, the original Forbes and Rigobin paper and a lot of later papers on contagion uh, do use the uh, Hong Kong real estate uh, crisis in 1997 as um, uh, a very uh, well-known um, example of contagion as uh, it originated in the Hong Kong market and then uh, affected multiple markets in the region and globally. So there, the origin of contagion is quite theoretically clear. However, in uh, other estimation that you might want to execute, it might not be. So there, you just look at the market where the volatility has increased the most and uh, treat it as your uh, origin of contagion. And this is because this would allow you to be most conservative with your uh, bias adjustment for the correlation coefficient. But let's proceed further and calculate the sample sizes. We'll count our non-crisis uh, observations. Again, we remember that the breakpoint is row 301. And then we can count the post um, breakpoint, so the crisis period observations, uh, going uh, until row 507, which is the end of our sample. We'll see that we've got 299 non-crisis observations and 206 crisis observations. And now the hero of our today's show, the measure of contagion as per the Forbes and Rigobin test, which is the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient during the non-crisis period, which is, again, all the way until row 301, uh, before the 11th of March 2020, if we evaluate the correlation between stocks and bonds there, it would be less than 0 0.01, it would be roughly zero. However, if we calculate it for the crisis period, again, we can just copy this formula and adjust the sample accordingly, we'll see that the correlation coefficient has increased quite a bit to 0 0.04. However, there might be bias, upward bias in the measurement due to the increase in the volatility of stocks. And this is exactly what we are going to implement now. We'll implement the adjusted correlation, uh, keeping in mind that our market of origin is the stock market. So here we need to divide the crisis correlation coefficient by the adjustment factor, which is the square root of one, plus the factor that measures how much the volatility has increased, or rather variance, because it squares the volatility in the formula. So it's the crisis volatility of our market of origin squared minus the non-crisis volatility of our market of origin squared divided by the squared volatility uh, in the non-crisis period. And then we multiply it by one minus the crisis correlation coefficient squared. Conceptually, this is um, quite easy to explain as the higher the volatility increase uh, in terms of the uh, origin market during the crisis period, the uh, more evidence we have got to suspect that the bias is large. So the larger it is, the more we'll be tending to adjust our correlation coefficient downward. However, this term over here shows that the larger the correlation coefficient that we measured here is, the more we have got uh, evidence to assume that this sort of increase was not uh, spurious, was not due to the volatility increase. So we've got two forces at play here that act against each other. The higher the volatility increase, the more adjustment we need to do, but the higher the measured correlation coefficient, the more we have uh, evidence to believe that this increase has been genuine. And having implemented the adjustment, we can see that our correlation has gone down by almost a factor of two. 
uh, if we implement the heteroscedasticity adjustment, we can no longer believe that the correlation coefficient is as high as 0.04, it's more like something like 0.02. And now we compare it to the non-crisis correlation, which is 0.0078, and then we can evaluate the differences between those two uh, measured in the level playing field coefficients according to the very familiar and the very simple Fisher transformation. We have got a separate video on just the broad application of Fisher transformation. What is different here is we plug in not the estimated correlation coefficient for the crisis period, but the adjusted one. And that's the main uh, contribution of the Forbes and Rigobin test. So for the Z stat of the Fisher transformation test, we need to logarithmically scale our correlation coefficients in the numerator. So a half of the natural logarithm of one plus the adjusted crisis correlation divided by one minus adjusted crisis correlation coefficient minus a half of the natural logarithm of one plus the non-crisis correlation divided by one minus the non-crisis correlation. That wraps up our numerator and for the denominator we just implement the square root and adjust for sample sizes and degrees of freedom reductions. So the square root of one over the crisis uh, sample size minus three plus one divided by the non-crisis uh, sample period minus three. And that generates a Z-statistic of 0 0.17, again, a very small Z-statistic, and the p-value could be calculated from a two-tailed Z-test, so two times one minus standard normal distribution of the absolute value of Z-statistic and one for cumulative, which gives us a p-value of 87%, which basically means that it's very likely that this increase in correlation, especially given the adjustment we made, is uh, not indicative of contagion. It's not enough evidence to presume that the correlation has increased substantially, that there has been financial contagion from the stock market onto the bond market uh, after the WHO announcement on the 11th of March 2020. Basically, financial contagion was not a thing, at least between stock and bond markets, given our chosen breakpoint and given our assumptions. This is all there is for the Fisher transformation implementation of the Forbes and Brigham test. However, there are further ways to improve upon that or generalize that, or even go into completely different directions. If you would like me to record videos on co skewness or co courtesis based contagion tests, or have a look at some of the uh, more advanced implementation of the Forbes and Brigham, please leave a like on this video and express your desire in the comments. As for now, thank you very much and stay tuned.